Dear audience, welcome to the 100th episode of the show Power Chat. We thank our audience for appreciating our show throughout these years. Today we are celebrating 100th episode of this development discussion. Our guest today is Mr. Feris Haddad Javas, Country Manager of World Bank Nepal. We will be discussing about economic growth of Nepal. Please allow me to welcome him. Welcome to the show, Mr. Javas. Thank you very much, Lakshman. Thank Happy you. And congratulations on your 100th uh, episode uh, anniversary. That's very monumental. Thank you very much. Thank you. And how have you been? Uh, well, well, very happy to be here on the 100th episode. So. Well, it's our pleasure to have you on <laughs> our show in 100th episode. Uh, it's been about eight months that mm -hmm. you joined uh, mm -hmm. World Bank uh, as the country manager mm -hmm. here in Nepal. How do you assess the overall uh, development process of Nepal uh, linking to uh, the economic you know, growth? Mm, yes. Well, I think um, in our line of business, when you're looking at development, this is, a, you know, this is a type of business where you're always in assessing and evaluating. You have to look at it uh, from a longer term perspective. So you have to really look back at the past, at the legacy. You have to look at the present. You have to project to the future. So this is not a short term business as such. So my assessment is always taking into account the past, present, and long-term horizon. And I think this is really what's what's important. And I think I would not be overly dramatic if I said that this is in, in many ways a new Nepal. This is a new country coming forth, you know, unfurling the 2015 constitution, which was a significant departure from the past of Nepal. You now have a new uh, paradigm in the country. You'll have 750, you have actually 761 if you take into account 753 municipalities, the seven provinces and the central government. So you have a completely different economic model. Um, and during this period, and now what you have, which is really, really Im important and somewhat unprecedented in current recent history, is that you have a government with a horizon that has the ability to project its vision and its strategy and implement it over many years. This is something, unfortunately, Nepal has not had in a long time. And this is a very important thing. Now, the thing is, uh, so let me just say, let me just uh, interrupt myself and say that I'm very hopeful. I'm very positive. I'm hopeful. I'm a, uh, a, a optimistic realist, as they say. Because if you look at the history of Nepal during a period of constant shocks, you had, of course, you know, the period leading to the, CP, to the comprehensive peace agreement with the insurgency and all of that. And then you have a country that is landlocked and is susceptible to a num multitude of shocks. They could be macroeconomic because you have a country where almost a third of uh, GDP comes from remittances, but you also have the susceptibility to the you know devastating earthquakes, the floods, etc. Nevertheless, over the past period, you've seen poverty, certainly absolute poverty, go down from 46% to 15% recently. Uh, you've seen the headline poverty go down to 25%, which is more than absolute poverty. You've seen during this period really important that the bottom 40, the B40, their spending and consumption over this period has actually was double that of the top 60. So there have been considerable gains in terms of, uh, uh, you know, basic uh, indicators. Uh, you've had uh, impressive gains in terms of poverty reduction and extreme poverty reduction. So that's very important. Now we're in a new Nepal. Now we're in a new model. Now we're talking about not only reconstruction, moving away from the legacy of the past of 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 of, of post sort of, of of conflict to civil disturbance or uh, uh, reconstruction to what is our new economic model how do we want to get to middle income country status by 2030 and i would argue that this is the right time to do it because the tools and the skill set and the strategy that you had in the past to extract you out of poverty will be fundamentally different from those tools that you need to propel you into middle-income countries. Yeah, stands. Mr. Javas, you raised very interesting issues that you are positive yeah. towards the new political, right. you know, uh, changed context. Do yeah. you think that the strategies that government is now preparing, addressing the economic challenges, mm -hmm. the fiscal challenges of this country, are in with the aspirations of the public of this country? Yeah. So your aspirations, let's start from the premise that your aspirations are a prosperous Nepal and a happy Nepal. And we all agree, there's no, uh, everybody agrees on that. And prosperous Nepal means economic growth, uh, uh, shared prosperity. Happy Nepali means a sense of self-fulfillment that goes beyond the GDP and all these indicators, right? So in that, you have to, and then the fiscal, the, the economic development, all of that goes into that. So if you look at that whole package, um, in terms of the fiscal, so you have a massive, as I said, unprecedented shift in the country, which is federalism. 
So there is understandably, and we have seen, and this is obviously something that everybody is worried about, the fiscal deficit and the spikes. It is not uncommon. In fact, it is extremely common for situations where a country wants to change its model for there to be a spike in spending in the short term. Right, so we see that now. Now, as a result of the uh, you know the transition to federalism, you're going to get spikes and additional spending. So that is entirely normal. Having said that, on the fiscal side, it's still very important to focus on expenditures, right? Public investor man uh, investment management. In order, just to give you a few numbers, and then I'll move a little bit to the economic growth. So let's agree, uh, prosperous Nepal, happy Nepal. In order to do that, you have to do a few things. Public spending. You need three players, right? Uh, public spending, which needs to be mo more efficient in many ways, because we've seen that uh, even uh, in the prior model, you have a lot, you know, you have at the end of every fiscal year, about 80, 70 to 80 percent of public projects are actually expended, that is expenditure done, which means that they're not all comp completed. Now, with the move to tra uh, transition to federalism, this is going to be even more complex and we need to work on it because you've decentralized and federalized uh, public investment. So we have to make sure that the spending is very uh, efficient and that's something that we are working with the authorities to make happen so there is movement the other one goes to the overall economic model right so if you want to get Nepal into middle income country status um, right now we have impressive GDP growth whereas in the past it was roughly around 4% now it's been hovering around we had 7.9 6.3 and we expect it to be roughly around 6% so this is pretty good if you want to get to middle income country status by 2030 you have to have at least 8% every year how do we get to 8%? Investment, for instance, there has been roughly an infrastructure, public investment, uh, roughly around 3% of GDP. In order to get to that level that we want to get to, you need at least, uh, you need to increase it by four, t uh, four times. So you, you need to go to 12 to 14% of GDP. How do we do that? Efficiency of public spending, but the private sector, bringing in private sector investment, local investment and, internet, and, and FDI, foreign direct investment. The absence of that, in order for us to bankroll this very aspirational, very realizable development agenda, it's going to be very difficult. So we need to be asking ourselves, how do we get foreign participation investment? It's not about the money, it's about the know-how. It's about bringing money, bringing international experience on how to operate businesses, infrastructure, etc. This is what we need to focus, and this is something the authorities are focused on. This is why we have the investor conference, and we're working very closely on the crowding and agenda. Well, Mr. Javas, I will come back to you on FDI yeah. and uh, the middle income status strategy of Nepal later. Do you think that uh, Nepal would be able to, you know, speed up in line with what you are uh, uh, presenting with the statistics that Nepal need to? speed up its growth. Do you think it is possible at the moment, given that the uh, money is not being spent, as you are referring? Well, I think, I think the window is open, right? So I think what you need is you need commitment, policies, operational regulations, and practice. Those are the things. Commitment is very clear is there. And I can, you know, I, I've seen it, and I think this has been expressed. We've seen it. In terms of the policies, it's no s doubt that, you know, we're looking forward to this investor conference in that the government will uh, announce and, and unveil a series of, you know, uh, uh, laws and policies and acts, etc., to actually make that easier. So I think that's possible. And I think this is necessary condition, necessary. However, it is insufficient. Because at the end of the day, an investor wants to come here, he wants to see here, he wants to see right policies, wants to see commitments. He says, okay, that's good. What happens on a Monday morning? So what are the operational, how do you operationalize these laws into day-to-day -day practice? With whom does a private investor interact on day-to-day -day problems, whether it's issue of getting visas, repatriation of uh, funds, etc. So I think we're getting there. I think we have a luxury now, which is a time span. We have a horizon of a few years. But windows open, the window is open, it's going to be around, but windows close. So I think we need to really focus. I think we're on the right path. Development is a path. It's not a specific date. It's not a specific time. It's not a location. It is a path. Always focus on the Delta. It's a long term. It's a cricket match, I say. It's not really, you know. So I think we're getting there. But now uh, we need to focus on the continued quality of laws. But then we need to put them into practice. And at the end of the day, an investor, and I come from a family of investors. I'm the only one who decided to go the wrong way and do development, is that at the end of the day, my family has never really you know, has looked at the laws, but at the end of the day, what they do is they will talk to another investor and they will say, hey, Lakshman, you invested in Nepal. How did it go? And we need to focus on those guys. What are the areas of legal reforms? Yeah. So let's, uh, uh, with your permission, let's sort of tilt the question into what is it that needs us to get 
to a sustainable development model, which relies on crowding in the private sector to to, uh, to complement public resources. And public resources and efficiency of public resources continues to be important. So let's talk about the bedrocks. An efficient public resource allocation system, public investment management system at the central and now at the new area, uh, f federalized areas so that public funds are spent transparently, efficiently, and projects get done, right? So, uh, so above that, then you look at uh, 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 what is it that, that uh, you need to get in terms of funding, um, if that's the question. I think what we have to look at is, um, let's, let's break it into three areas. I think this is the best way to lo look at it. What are the three constraints? What are the three things? One is looking at the competitiveness of firms here in Nepal. In Nepal, about 18 to 20 percent of firms have more than 20 uh, personnel, uh, 20 staff, right? If you look at your neighbors, that's usually about 40 to 50 percent, right? So there's a little bit of a capture. You have a few small firms that have actually a lot of staff and then many small firms. Most of these do not export. So the first thing we need to do is we need to work on getting investment to make Nepali firms competitive and part of the global value chain. Right now, they're importing a little bit, some uh, exporting a little bit uh, 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 of goods. So we need to un unshackle the, the horizon for for these, uh, for these small and make them competitive and linked to things. We have to look at, uh, you know, uh, what are the costs of the inputs they're getting? Um, what are the costs? Uh, are there any impediments to getting investment in these companies? There's a number of areas, and the government is looking at that. So the issue is one: make firms linked to global value chains and competitive. The other is access to finance, right? And it's not just access to finance. I would say access to long-term finance, um, uh, because you know. If you look at this uh, uh, structure here, most of the financial sector, almost 80% is dominated by banks, which is good. I mean, they're doing their job, they're trying to do their best, but there's not a diversification. 40% of surveyed businesses in Nepal report that getting access to finance, long-term finance is a problem. So we link to markets, but then we make sure that there's long-term finance. We need to work on capital market development, making sure there's long-term. I uh, think we have to look at the uh, deepening of the stock market. We have to look at diversifying of this. But also capital markets in terms of long-term bonds, etc. That's another issue. And the third one is what we all know, which is the access to infrastructure. Without proper infrastructure, it's unlikely to get investment. And this is where public and private partnerships are going to be very important. No, there is uh, public criticism that people mm. have never been given opportunity to participate in the economic, you know, activities as such. And mm. at the time when country has already gone through federalism mm. with different provinces, three tiers of mm. uh, levels of mm. government, do you think that uh, the uh, government at sub-national and mm. local levels would mm. be able to, you know, maximize their finances and resources? Absolutely. So. Uh, if we are, and we are certainly, as laid out in the Constitution and what we've seen, and the bank has been engaged in this and, and supporting the federalism uh, uh, transition along with other development partners, including uh, the UN system and others. I have to say that I've been here, just to give you a testament to that, I've been here for eight months now, and I've gone to Province 1 all the way to Sudur Paschim. I've been to the seven provinces, I've visited the Palikas. So ultimately, insofar as we want to federalize the country, federalizes the growth storyline, uh, growth has to be endogenous from the federalized area. So growth cannot be centralized. And this is a process. Again, let's keep in mind, I think this is very important. It is urgent, but we have to keep in mind the process and the horizon by which things happen. Many countries, including my own, right? I come from the U.S. We are 200 more than, you know, reaching our third century, right? But there's always continued issues and natural and healthy issues related to the process of federalism transition. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. But I think, again, I would uh, label it into public, private, and supporting infrastructure. On the public side, and this is where the bank has been working with partners, is the public financial management system. The flow of resources and funds through the central terms of expenditure to the uh, to the federal areas so they can under can undertake not only their operations and management but public uh, investment management so their own projects there are projects that will always be national but subnational projects we actually have a very big portfolio here we're also federalizing decentralizing our projects so one is to make sure that there is the right pipes the public financial uh, management system and we're working and I have to give credit actually to the Ministry of Finance because they've unveiled the Financial Procedures Act and things I won't waste your time with this that are actually creating a very robust system and there is some vision behind that so make sure that there's transparent flow of pipes 
That is necessary, again, but insufficient. We need the right cadres there. They need to be properly trained to use the systems, and they need to be able to implement. This is extreme priority, and we need to work on it with extreme urgency. It will not be resolved overnight. Then, last but not least, is the supporting infrastructure. And this is where a very clear system, and, and the government is leading the work on a new public-private uh, partnership act that is coming out. The ability to get the private sector engaged in providing the bedrock infrastructure will make all of this happen. Could you also uh, tell us about World Bank's uh, priorities here in Nepal? How are you supporting the strategies yeah. of you know, poverty reduction and inclusive development plan of Nepal government? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, if we are, and I think we are, you know, a respectable, uh, well-meaning development institution, our priorities should not exist. They should be government priorities and the people priorities. So it's the priorities of the people of Nepal as manifested through their democratically elected governments and civil society, which includes private sector, different groups, etc. And we reflect that in our strategy. So if you were to ask me what sort of keeps me up at night, what are the things that I focus on in supporting Nepal's own development agenda? It's one, ensuring a successful transition to federalism. Within the mandate of the institution, we focus on economic issues. We're not into politics and all of that. So making sure that the public financial and the fiscal pipes are there for adequate transport. And then also to explore what is the revenue raising potential in these uh, areas. So the flow of funds, capacity, working with our development partners. And we work with many, including uh, UK DFID, uh, uh, Swiss Development Cooperation, UN. There's so many of them, USAID, European Union, etc. One of them is looking at capacity building um, at that level so people can actually implement projects. So the federalism transition is number one. Secondly is the overall economic environment. As we said, Nepal now has has reconstructed. It's a new country. There's a new social contract. There's a new model. For us to achieve the SDGs, SDGs are very important, the Sustainable Development Goals, and we all subscribe to the SDGs, right? So it's, a, it's an umbrella that covers all of this. And Nepal is one of the most committed to the SDGs. To achieve the SDGs and middle income country status by 2030, we need 8% growth and we need to quadruple investment. So we need to get an investor to say, I am looking at Nepal and I am looking at another country. With all due respect to Nepal's history, Nepal has made tremendous strides over the past years. Where Nepal was before and where Nepal is now is a fundamentally different place. An investor couldn't care less. An investor cares about what Nepal is vis-a-vis -vis another country. We need to get these people to decide to come here as opposed to go another country. We have taken the first steps. These first steps are a series of laws and acts. I say we, I'm speaking as, as if I'm a Nepali government. I'm speaking as a group which includes our client who's in the middle. Put in place the bedrock laws that are going to be necessary. There have been investments in the country, not enough, absolutely. And I think now going to the investor conference, this is going to be a very important event. Now we have to set, you know, we have to be clear that this investor conference that the government is calling together on March 29th, 30th, is going to be a great opportunity for the government to unveil, say, look, we're now open for business. We are serious about this reform. And this is how we prove to you that we're Mr. serious. Mr. Jobs, uh, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the, the summit, the proposed summit mm -hmm. in March, 2019 yeah. would be able to you know attract uh, foreign investors here in Nepal and why do you think that foreign investment in Nepal is necessary at the moment yeah so uh, without f uh, without foreign investment you will not be able to realize without investment including domestic investment and foreign investment you will not be able to realize uh, the ambitious but realizable agenda of meeting the SDGs and reaching middle-income country status by 2030 and to provide for prosperous Nepal and happy Nepali. The investor conference is very important because it signals to the world, if it is well planned, and I believe it will be, that A, to show our commitment, to show the government's commitment that, look, we are open and we are serious about bringing investment, to put the commitment into practice, to say we have put together the laws to make it happen, and to start talking to investors, and it's not the first time. There have been investments that come in, have been coming into the but It's not enough, but there have been. To sit with them and say, okay, what is it that got you here, and what more do you need to come more with more money and bring more investors? And this is going to be one important event in a series of events, right? This does not mean that this is the end of it. This is part of a broader thread of engagement. 
and to see what other uh, investment is coming in. So I think that's going to be very invest very important. And I keep just want to add one more thing that investment is half about money, but more about getting the right technical expertise, experience, and global practices. I think that's going to be very important. So I'm hopeful. Well, you also touched upon public-private uh, sector partnerships here in Nepal. Yeah. Criticisms most of the time coming from the private sector that government or the state organs have not been creating environment favorable for mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. How can the levels of public and private partnership be boosted at the moment? Yeah. Well, I think there's an element of truth that currently, although there is an improvement uh, and, and a considerable improvement, that we're not there yet in terms of the investment climate. I don't think anybody's uh, pretending that it is. I don't think the authorities have set expectations that it is. But you see investors, again, we have to keep this in context. Investors are people who evaluate risk and make a decision to put money in view of the risks engaged. And as a result, they will get their return. That's what an investor is. An investor is not a bond issuer who comes to make sure that the invi So investors, by their very nature, want to go into places that nobody else has come to before. And what they will look at is they will say, okay, this is a place, we have investors here, but there's a lot of space for us to come in with resources and we will get an adequate return. What they want to see is they want to see predictability and stability. In a sense, an investor wants the government to be the most boring counterpart that you ever deal with because they have to be predictable and they have to do this. So what the government is doing in, in our assessment is they, they're really expressing their views. Uh, they're saying that, you know, the proper laws are in place. But now, you know, the feedback of the private sector must be heard with great vigor and great clarity. We must listen to the voices of the Nepali private sector and to say, look, this is necessary but important. What is holding us back? It's true that you have these laws. Are we able to repatriate funds? Are we able to do this? Are we able to get visas, for instance, for foreign investors? And now we have to work on the day-to-day -day challenges they face in order to make this happen. Well, uh, what are the areas of reforms in relation to public finance uh, management, including that of your own you know, uh, assistance to Nepal? How mm -hmm. do you ensure that the resources coming from World Bank Group here in Nepal are uh, utilized with uh, utmost transparency? Okay. Um, so we have our resources. We have uh, the world, not only the World Bank, I mean, many partners. In fact, m many of us, we have, of course, have our partners in the uh, ADB and others. We have uh, our own fiduciary, what we call the fiduciary and safeguard standards by which we, so again, I should say, and, and you know this, but just for the audience, in case they don't know it, the World Bank does not execute projects here. We are a financier to the government and policy advice provider as, the, uh, as public and private institutions sometimes execute development projects. So we think, I mean, the whole point of the World Bank and this idea of maximizing finance development is every dollar of World Bank assistance is only important in so f insofar as it creates the right pipes of public financial management, procurement uh, safeguards, environmental and social safeguards that will allow public resources of Nepal and international funds to go through the same pipes. So for us, we have a rigorous public financial management system, but I would argue to it doesn't matter. What matters is that we implant these systems within Nepal so that public resources of the government of Nepal flow through these systems. And this is why it's important. Well, Mr. Uh, Jobs, there are many interesting issues, but we are coming to the end of the show. With my follow-up questions on uh, what are your recommendations to the government of Nepal, mm -hmm. you know, uh, overcoming fiscal challenges very quickly? In terms of fiscal challenges, I think, uh, well, the fiscal challenge is actually revenue generation and then expenditures. And I think on the revenue generation, again, with, with uh, the work, the solid, rigorous work of the Minister of, Honorable Minister of Finance and Ministry of Finance, you see a lot of reforms, actually. You do see it at the, at the technical level, and there's some you know, new audit bill and things that are coming that are very important, particularly in terms of changing the architecture to a new federal system. That's, so that's going to be important. But my advice would be on the expenditure side. There's a lot of stuff, but we have limited time, right? Um, on the expenditure side, I think we need to look at the efficiency of spending. And it's not an issue of how much resources, but what are people getting for the resources? So we need to focus really on public investment. These investments, we have to make sure that they're executed on time. We have to make sure that every uh, rupee, every dollar, every whatever is used to the maximum impact. So there's a lot of focus on building the cadre for execution. This has, I would say, frankly, been an issue historically in Nepal. 
it's a, more of a risk of being an issue at the if, uh, as we federalize. So this has to be focused. This has to be focused uh, uh, of development partners and the government and the provinces and the palikas. How do we spend Nepali people's money wisely, quickly, and efficiently? Do you have anything that I have left to ask you that you want to say to our audience very quickly? Okay, thank you. Well, I'm not lacking in words, as you can see, so I'm sure I have a lot of things. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I would just like to say that, you know, my, my own reading, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think, you know, this is actually, it's your 100th uh, anniversary. For us, it's uh, it's our 50-year uh, anniversary being in the World Bank, uh, being the World Bank as a trusted partner to the people of Nepal. So I'm very happy to be here on our 50th anniversary, and you're... Uh, 100th episodes and we look forward to staying the course i want to take advantage to just uh, uh do a pitch actually that you know we actually have an upcoming th there's a lot of things to discuss but we have an upcoming conference we haven't talked about due to the limits in time about other issues including gender and mainstreaming gender into projects but we have a very important conference which is women in the power sector we power conference that's february 20th and 21st here at Kathmandu and this brings in from 100, 150 practitioners from throughout South Asia who are looking here about how and to inject uh, uh, more women at all levels of management of the power sector. So these are very important issues that I hope you'll invite me on your 120th show. Sure, it would be my pleasure, uh, Mr. Javis. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dear audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste.